All right, that moves us to our next presentation. And um, this is another dear friend of ours. Um, as Dr. Cope mentioned, there's very little research that's done on Angleria. And that's one of the things that our foundation and our board wanted to focus on because there had been very little done. So in the last three years, we've raised several thousand dollars and we decided to offer a, gr uh, a grant for research to the next presenter. And with that, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Francine Marciano Cabral. She's a professor and researcher at uh, University of Virginia Commonwealth School of Medicine and she's going to give us an update, which we haven't heard yet, so we're as excited to hear this as you are, um, about some different things that we ask her to do research on, on Nigleria. Dr. Cabral? Sure, I know what we've got here. Okay. I just want to make sure this is on. Oops. Okay. So I'm going to start off by telling you that we all know that Nigleria falleri is a free-living amoeba. It's not a true parasite. It never has to infect a human like a true parasite does to survive itself. All right, it can live out in the environment. It feeds on bacteria, yeast, and it can be perfectly happy out there. So we ask ourselves, why does it cause a fatal disease of the central nervous system if it's not a true parasite? Uh, we don't really know the answer to that. We know very little about the biochemistry of uh, Nigleria falleri. Uh, we don't know what makes it a, a real pathogen. We don't know what factors contribute to the virulence of Nigleria falleri. Thus, the research in our laboratory this past year has been twofold. We have been studying invasion processes in vitro by Nigleria, which I'll show you what that is in a minute. And also now, uh, we're concentrating more on environmental factors. We have been looking at different environmental factors that affect the survival of Nigleria falleri in wet water. So many people always ask me this question, why do some people become infected and others do not? And these are just four theoretical, uh, I'll tell you which ones I feel are probably really good. Um, some people feel there may be an immune defect because in the nasal passages, the mucosal uh, immunity takes place and the antibody is an IgA antibody and that is very important for mucosal immunity. And some people feel that there may be a deficiency in that antibody in the mucosal area. Some have told me that they feel there may be a structural defect in the nasal uh, passages or even in the cribriform plate. I don't know, I, that's been suggested to me. I feel that it may be exposure to a very large number of amoebae and more importantly, that it may be exposure to a virulent strain. I can show you uh, by our animal studies, our animal passage, we use mice in the laboratory, that once Nigleria that's grown in culture in the laboratory, once we passage it through mice and we remove the brain and, and then we get, collect those amoeba, we call them mouse passaged, those are much more virulent than the ones that we grow in the laboratory in a media. So I think that's something that might be extremely important is that exposure to a virulent strain may be one of the re reasons. All right, so let me tell you about the research that we're doing in our laboratory. We have highly pathogenic and weakly pathogenic strains of Nigleria falleri, and we've been studying uh, you know, their proteins and compare protein profiles of the two. Uh, we're looking at differences in their ability to invade the extracellular matrix. 
This is a network of polysaccharides and proteins like collagen in which all of our cells are embedded. So when the amoeba enters the nasal passages, it's going to have to travel up and eventually go through the extracellular matrix to get to the brain. And so that's very important, we feel, to see how is it invading. And our very important, I feel, um, environmental studies are we're looking at the tolerance of Nigleria falleri to the pH of water, the hydrogen ion concentration of water. We're looking at salinity of water and also differences in temperature. And can Nigleria falleri uh, tolerate these differences? Okay, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the invasion assays we've been doing. These are performed to determine whether the amoeba secrete proteins for invasion. The amoeba are allowed to interact with collagen matrix for several hours, up to 18 hours. The media is collected and examined for protein secretions. We do an experiment called gel zymography. This is performed to identify secreted proteins and to determine whether the amoeba are secreting proteases that can break down collagen and allow for invasion. Zymography is actually a tool for detecting proteases. A highly pathogenic and the weakly pathogenic strains are tested to determine if there are differences. Okay, this is what the invasion assay um, involves. Um, we have these 12 well plates. I'm almost afraid to touch this, and I'm afraid I'll turn it off. Let's see. I want it to point. No, I can't. All right. It was? Oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> It's not like my classroom. Oh. oh, there we go. Okay, great. Okay, so this is the invasion assay that we do in the lab, okay? All right, these are called 12 well plates right here. And they have these wells in them. And these are inserts. And these inserts then will get placed in the 12 wells. These inserts are coated with collagen or matrigel. Right here, it's a thick, we let it solidify and it's a thick layer. We then place the amoeba on top of this with its collagen, for example. And then there's media, the amoeba are in the media. And on the bottom of the well, okay, there's a media that the amoeba would like to go to. And so in order for the amoeba to get from here to down to the bottom, they have to do something to invade. And so that's what we've been looking at. And what you see here, actually, is here's the amoeba inside the well, which is over here, okay? And here's after several hours, we start seeing the amoeba down here on the bottom. So we collect the media in the top, and we collect this liquid media in the bottom, and we test that to see what the amoeba are secreting. Okay, this is what a gel zymogram looks like of secreted proteases. It's actually an SDS polyacrylamide gel that has gelatin in it. And these are gelatinase enzymes, or proteases. And so if the amoeba are secreting these, we can detect it and we can detect it by these, uh, these white bands in the gel. Okay, we stain the gel after and we look for these white bands. MP stands for mouse passage. These are highly pathogenic. And exenic stands for exenically cultured. These are weakly pathogenic. So when you culture amoeba, Nigleria falleri, in media in the laboratory, and you keep it in that for long periods of time, it loses its virulence. And so we passage the amoeba in, mouse, in a mouse for about once or twice a month, and then we take the brain and we culture it, and we get those, and they are highly pathogenic when they come out of the mouse brain. Okay, so what you see here is that if you compare the highly pathogenic to the weakly pathogenic, 
there's much more reactivity on the gel in the highly uh, pathogenic one. And this is a scanning electron micrograph. Okay, this one shows the, um, this shows a collagen matrix. Here's the amoeba sitting on top of the matrix. Okay, now it's got to get through. It's got to break through here somehow. It does push its way too, but in addition to that, it's secreting proteases that allow it to break down the collagen, collagenases, and here comes the amoeba through the collagen. All right. This is Matrigel, another example here. Here's the amoeba on top, and now they start secreting proteases, and here they are coming through and breaking down the Matrigel. So proteases are very important in terms of invasion. Um, they play a critical role. This is a particular type of protease. These are called matrix metalloproteases. And these proteases play a critical role in CNS invasion in other pathogenic protozoa. Plasmodium falciparum, the causative agent of malaria, causes cerebral malaria. It's got to get in the brain. It uses matrix metalloproteases. The trypanosoma brucei, those involved in African sleeping sickness, they also can get in the brain. That's how they cause the sleeping sickness. And Balamuthia mandularis, that's another of the free-living amoeba that gets into the brain. They all secrete matrix metalloproteases, and um, that's how they break through collagen and the extracellular matrix. These proteases are also upregulated in um, tumor cells, and that's how they metastasize. The tumor cell can leave where it is and uh, move to another area and invade, and they use these um, matrix metalloproteases. All right, and just to confirm that we ha really do have these, we made host cell lysates of the amoeba, and we use, and we run them. It separates the um, proteins of the amoeba on gels, and then we have antibodies to the matrix metalloproteases, and we just stain it to confirm that the amoeba contained these matrix metalloproteases. So that's one set of experiments we're doing. We have just finished that. What I'd like to say is that their highly pathogenic nigleria secrete greater amounts of matrix metalloproteases, and these are definitely the enzymes that are breaking down host tissues and allow the amoeba to invade tissues. We just got a manuscript accepted for publication in the Journal of Microbiology on these studies, so that was Good. Um, okay, now our second objective, and the one we're really concentrating on now, are environmental studies. These environmental uh, conditions are studied to affect, we want to know which ones affect survival or destruction of nigleria in fresh water. And so we're looking at pH, salinity, and temperature tolerance of nigleria. The pH is a measure of how acidic or basic the water is, okay, from 1 to 14. pH of the water is 1 to 4. Um, pH of 7 is neutral. And pH of 8 to 14 is basic. Then we're looking at salinity. This is a measure of the salts dissolved in water. Sodium chloride is the major salt in ocean, and so we're looking at that. And we're looking at temperatures. Okay, so our pH studies are the following. Either hydrochloric acid or sodium hydroxide were added to sterile fresh water and the pH was measured with a pH meter. Then hydrochloric acid was added such that the acid pH of water was from pH one to six. Sodium hydroxide was added to water to obtain water with a basic pH of either eight to 14. Then the Nigleria falleri were cultured in a media. We remove the media, and then we add the acid or basic water, and we incubate them at 37 to determine viability. Okay, I, don't, I hope you can see that. 
anyway. These are the amoeba that would grow in media. Whoops, uh oh, uh oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, that's the amoeba that are growing in media. And then what we do is we take the media off, that's what they like, and we put them in the water that has a pH of one. That's as acidic as you can get. And while they may look like amoeba trophozoites, they are so-called dead in their tracks. As soon as we put them in water, fresh water that has a pH of one, they're just, they're gone. They're non-viable, okay? So they cannot tolerate one. And within 24 hours, what you see, I'm pressing the wrong one, sorry. With the, with the um, I'm sorry, with the pH of one, within 24 hours, they're all disintegrating, okay? All right, so now we went up to pH two, the next pH, and these are also non-viable. They're dead in one hour, all right? It, they have to round up. It takes them about an hour to round up like that. pH one, they just, that, that's it immediately. But pH two, it takes about an hour. And 24 hours later, you can see again, they're all disintegrating. So pH one and two are really toxic to the amoeba. Um, the next one, we did pH 3. We just kept going up the scale. And pH 3 does eventually um, cause them to die, but not as fast as with pH 1 and 2. That took about four hours to get them to that point. Um, and then pH 4, the next pH up, they are viable. And they're viable um, at 24 hours also. So pH 4 is not toxic, that toxic to the amoeba. Um, then we went to the basic side, okay? So the basic water starts um, at eight to um, 14. So we started, I don't show all the pHs that we did, but we tested uh, seven, eight, nine, 10. And then when we got to 11, I thought that would be good to show. Um, they're still viable. They are viable. You can see a lot of cysts form. These are cysts forming because the amoeba are not really that happy at this pH, but they are viable and they are alive. And you can see here that there are a number of trophozoites that are uh, moving. All right, and then over on the other side, that's 96 hours later. Okay, they're still viable. I don't know, I hope you can see that, but there's a trophozoite or amoeboid form that's moving. And here's another one, and these are all cysts. So the longer they stay in this water, the more insistent. And that's gonna be important because we don't know if the cysts are infective, okay? Everybody says it's the trophozoite, the amoeboid form. So what we're gonna do now that we have found a way to get uh, a pure culture of cysts to make sure it is the cyst that's infective, we're gonna treat them with different pHs and try to get a pure culture of cysts to test. This, okay, so then we did um, 11, 12, and uh, uh, after we did 11, we did 12, 13, and 14. That's the highest base you could get to, to measure, and they are all non-viable right away, immediately. They cannot uh, stand that pH, okay. So pH tolerance, and and Fowleri can survive in water with an acid pH from about 3.5 to 6, and obviously 7, which is neutral. But they do form cysts after 24 hours. Amoeba are non-viable at an acid pH of 1 and 2, and that's what we like when they when they are non-viable immediately, or the sooner they're non-viable, the better. And that's the same for chlorine treatment. Amoeba are viable in water with the basic pH of eight to 11, but they become non-viable at 12, 13, and 14. So those are the pH studies, but the good thing about that is it shows us how to make cysts. Okay, now summer started, and uh, people that know I work with it in the lab started bringing in their pool water and asking me to put it on our cultures of Nigleria. And I was very happy to do that. 
um, to let them know if their um, pool water was, you know, properly chlorinated. Um, so again, we grow the amoeba in these cultures, okay, like this. This is in media. And then we put them in fresh water, and they'll just still be like this for a while. And then what we do is we can either remove um, the, uh, me we remove the media that they've been growing in that we culture them in, and then we put them in pool water. And this is a person who didn't properly chlorinate their pool, because what you see here are several amoebas, okay? The trophozoite, the ones that move along. And here there are some, they, I mean, so they put some chlorine in, but not enough. So I was happy that they asked me to check their pool, and I did, and that's what we found. Now, oh, wait a minute. Okay, so here's a situation where somebody properly chlorinated their swimming pool, okay? And they, at their pH of their pool was about in the sevens, it's neutral, the pH. But what was important was how much chlorine they put in. And they have three parts per million chlorine in their pool, and that's proper chlorination, and there it killed all the amoebas right away. Now let me just tell you though about this pool. A few days later, he brought me some more, um, his daughter brought me, because she has children that swim in his pool, and she brought me some more water, and she said, check my father's pool again for me. And this was just a couple days later, but a lot of kids had been swimming in that pool, some of them may have urinated or defecated in the pool, okay? And at the same time, because you know how that goes. Um, <laughs> and then, um, it was very warm at that period of time, too. And so th there was a lot of sunlight. And it's not all the, just the, the uh, what's in the pool itself, okay? But we need free chlorine. And once the free chlorine is taken up, and combines, then it's not effective anymore. And sunlight makes the chlorine dissipate. So even a lot of uh, sunlight will cause the chlorine to, to dissipate. So what you see here on this side is the same water from the same pool that was not, anything was done to it for a couple of days, okay? And now the amoeba are surviving again. So you got to really be careful about pools and make sure if you're going to have a freshwater pool that it's properly chlorinated. And they have so many types of test strips and things that you can use to test your pools and make sure that you have enough chlorine and, um, you know, that they're, they're safe. Okay, and that the pH, you can just put the pH in there. In fact, his pool was a pH 8, but um, he had lots of chlorine in there initially. Okay. Now, I went, to the, I went to the beach, and I brought back some ocean water, and I put that on the amoebas. And so what I want to tell you is I'm going to go to this beach. It's salt water, of course. But here you have, and less, it really was less than an hour. This is growing the amoeba and then just taking the media off and putting ocean water on it, salt water, and they died immediately again, okay? They're non-viable. And 24 hours later, okay, that same culture, the amoeba are all disintegrating. So salt water is really the best place to swim, to be honest with you. Um, ooh. So we started our... What's happening? I'm going backwards? Uh-oh. Okay, salinity. Sorry. Okay, so pool salt was added to fresh water and the salinity was adjusted. This is the amount of salt in fresh water. We, we did that. We measured it. You can measure salinity with a, um, I don't know if I skipped one. Oh, I didn't. Okay. Here. Um, you can add salt to the fresh water, and then you can use a refractometer to measure the salinity in parts per million. Okay, we know for a fact that ocean water is approximately 34,000 parts per million. 
And so we adjusted our fresh water to 2,000 parts per million, all the way up to 36 parts per million, and we tested that against the amoeba. And um, we then uh, examined them at different time periods. So let me show you some of that. Okay, how do we do this? We, I purchased some pool salt. This is, people are now having saltwater pools. And I bought the pool salt. And so we had, took that and we added the pool salt to uh, fresh water. And we measured the salinity. And we then, after culturing the amoeba, we put this on the amoeba, okay? And we looked for viability. We looked to see if the amoeba were dead or alive. Okay, so this is just to show you the difference again. What you see up here are amoeba here. These are, first they're um, cultured in media and then we take the media off and put fresh water on and they can stay like this for at least 24 hours. Um, eventually they will form cysts because they need a food source. Um, and then this is in salt water. They're dead, they're dead right away, okay? So that's one way to avoid PAM. Now, we looked at 2,000, we started low at 2,000 parts per million. We looked at them for 24 hours and they're still viable. So 2,000 parts per million is not enough. Okay, 48 hours, they're starting to insist, and the amoeba are getting very, very small, as you can see here, but they're still viable. And then at 72 hours, they're, some of them are small and all, but there's still some, like right here is a trophozoite, and here's one. So they're still at 72 hours, they're still viable. So we started going up on the scale. We started adding more pool salt to see what would happen. And we went up to 5,000. And these are viable here. Okay, see, they're starting to look a little bit weird, and they are, but um, they're still very viable at 24 hours. And even at 48, here's a, an amoeba that's moving along in this salt water. Okay, and these are all cysts here. Then look at okay, uh, 5,072 hours. They finally get to be non-viable. But the purpose of this really is you want to get, you want to have non-viable amoeba immediately. You don't want to wait 72 hours because meanwhile somebody can be swimming in that pool and there are live amoebas. All right, what do we do next? We went up to 7,000, and I have to say that even at 7,000, although many of them are starting to die, like right here, okay, here's another one. Uh, these are, are already non-viable, but in 24 hours, okay, they are viable. And they're not looking normal because they are getting ready to, to go, but they're still viable. Um, and you can see at 48 hours what they look like, okay? Lysed, okay? And these are now becoming non-viable. So finally, but there's still some that are alive. 8,000 to 10,000, we finally got to a parts per million where most of the amoeba are dying. And you can see they don't even look like normal amoebas, and they're not actually. Uh, I think they're undergoing a, a process called apoptosis in which the amoeba will die. The, our own cells go through apoptosis, okay? Okay, that's 24 hours, 16,000. These are non-viable pretty fast. These are all dead amoebas here. You see how they are? They look like they're ready to explode when you put them in salt, actually. And they're all um, right here. All of these are non-viable. Okay, so 18,000. We add, the reason it says fresh media up there is because sometimes we look at these cultures and we can't really tell if they're dead or alive. 
So with all these experiments, when we put them in salt or acids or bases, a couple days later, when they look like they might be dead, but we can't be positively sure, we add fresh media, which is the media they grow in and they um, you know, will divide and start growing. And um, we did that with the 18,000 and they never grew back, even though we added fresh media. So that's what the fresh media means up there. Uh, at 18,000 parts per million and they're dead. Um, so we wanted to get close to what salt water is. And when we made it 30,000 parts per million, all right, or 30 um, parts per thousand, these are all non-viable right away, just like here. This is the ocean water again that I put on, okay? So we're pretty similar. You can make a pool um, to be something like the ocean, <coughs> something. All right, so our salinity results are so far, this is, now this is so far. Um, from 2,000 to about 7,000, they remind, remain viable, even as cysts, for up to about 72 hours. And the amoeba in pool salt at 16,000, 18,000 parts per million were non-viable in 24 hours and even less. And amoeba in 30,000 parts per million 30 um, parts per thousand of pool salt or ocean water, they're non-viable right away, at less than one hour even. Okay, so um, that was a, we were happy to see that, that you could do that. You can have a, uh, a salt water pool and you can be very safe. Okay, I'll just go quickly through the temperature tolerance, okay? Again, we did this in fresh media. We grew up the amoebas, and we take off the media and put sterile fresh water on and incubate them at different temperatures. And most of the literature, you know, people will do it up to 43 degrees, but we wanted to see if the amoeba would survive beyond 43 degrees. And I, I was surprised, actually. Um, here we are at 37 again, our amoebas, and here we have 44 degrees. And even though mo most of them are starting to insist, all right, we still have, I, I don't know if you can see this very well, but there are trophozoites or amoeboid forms there moving around. So they can tolerate 44 for um, at least 24 and even longer, by the way. 49, this one was amazing to me because it was actually 24 hours in this culture. Even though some of them are dying, which is difficult for you to see, but because I, I recognize something undergoing apoptosis because we've looked at it so many times. So they are starting to die. And here's 50 degrees in 24 hours. They're even still surviving here. Look, here's the amoeboid forms right here. Most of them, though, insist, but there are still some viable amoeba there that are in the amoeboid form. 47, 48, they're, uh, 48 hours, and 49, at 48 hours, they are non-viable. Okay, and I just want to show you that. And that 72 hours, they're all disintegrating. Okay, so temperature does play a very important, I, I know everybody knows that, but temperature does play a very important role in the viability of these amoeba. Just want to show you that at the high temperatures, like 50, and even if you go over 43 and you're at 42, after 72 hours, most of them now are cysts. And now I'm happy to say that because I can do this 44, thing for 44 degrees, uh, culture them at that for 72 hours, and I should have a pretty much of a uh, cyst thing, and I'm going to use those now to infect mice to see if the cysts are infective. Okay, oh, there. Okay, oh, wait, I know we did 52 too, but they die right away, okay? They're, they're gone. They're not viable. All right, so pH non-viable at acid pH 1 to 2. Um, they're viable from about 3.5 to 11. Salinity uh, and, and the basic water was 12 to 14. They're non-viable. 
um, salinity, ocean water is non-viable in less than one hour. Pool salts at 16,000, non-viable right away too, pretty much, and better at 30,000, just like the ocean. And temperature and fowler I can survive for 24 hours at about 49 to 50. And that's the end of my talk. Um, I just want to gratefully thank Steve and Shelley Smelsky for all they have done and they continue to do and for the foundation support. I thank the Florida Hospital and all the people there who have helped put this effort together. And a special thank you to Lee DeGrandis and Jack Tracy and Donna Verling and Todd McLachlan and everybody who's helped with this. I thank you very, very much, okay? Okay. If you have any questions, I mean, you can ask me question. anything. Question over here. Oh. Yes. Hey, doctor. Thank you. Uh, I was curious. Did you check the the viability of these amoeba in cooler waters? Because you know, in Florida, we've got the springs here that maintain about seventy two degrees, and I actually swim almost daily in the springs. <laughs> do that the only thing is I mean if I put them in the refrigerator you know which is like four degrees I mean they'll all insist they don't die right away they just insist but oh, okay. we're gonna try to do different cold temperatures I think that's very important they'll probably insist but I don't know that for sure. Great. thank you anybody oh I just wanted to make a comment. Um, we get the question about saltwater pools all the time, and it is a common, a bit of a common misconception that the saltwater is the disinfection itself, and it's great to see that salinity work, that it, it is killed at higher le levels of salinity. Um, but saltwater pools are actually, they're using the salt um, to make chlorine in, the, in, in a saltwater pool, so you're actually creating the chlorine, and so the chlorine is also there um, being made by the salt to, uh, to disinfect the pool as well. No, they're using, they're, it's a chemi you know, chemical reaction with the, the sodium chloride. Um, they're passing, I don't, I'm, this is not my expertise, but I know that that's what's happening in saltwater pools to, to create um, chlorine. So um, our answer is usually a well-functioning saltwater pool um, should have adequate levels of chlorine to, to um, control and kill the myglaria. Yeah, yeah, that's very important. You're right, you're right. Thank you. There's some kind of an instrument, which I really don't know what it's called, but that's what they use for the pulp, uh, salt water pools that mixes the salt and the chlorine together Apparently, it's supposed to be the appropriate level, so I don't know. I don't know. I haven't tried that yet. <laughs> okay. Anybody? Yeah. Oh, I'm I sorry. I have a question. Thank you. Uh, as a concerned grandmother that has a swimming pool, um, and my grandchildren are in it all the time, how do the amoeba get in the pool in the first place? Okay, that's a very good question also. The way it gets in the pool is usually there's like a lot of dirt and grass around the pool. If people used cement to surround the pool, that would be a protective mechanism. But the kids run around on the grass and the soil, and the amoeba are in moist soil. So they could take it and track it in the pool themselves on their feet. I mean, maybe there's only a few. That's why I think the number of amoeba is important, but I don't know if you have grass around your pool. You got cement? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> Sleep tonight. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Well, we're trying, okay? That's all I can do. Thank, I have to give him a hug. Thank okay. you, Dr. Cabral. <laughs>